Um, I'm very happy that you noticed it because uh, my goal was sort of create a beginner tutorial, but with a complex sculpt. And uh, that's why I kind of spent hours in ZBrush manual, like uh, trying to to describe every tool in the correct way. And uh, I hope like people would f find it useful. Maybe like they could actually like start 3D, feel less intimidated. Like my, my goal was uh, with the sculpt uh, was to, um, like if some people like my work and sort of inspire them because uh, like at the end of the tutorial, there's like a, a finished sculpt that's fairly complex and then they might like it. Uh, and if they follow along, they might find that they made something interesting as well. Please welcome today's guest, Arsen Asirankulov. Arsen is a concept artist and 3D concept sculptor whose visceral work has to be seen to be believed. I was excited to speak with him, not only to talk shop about his process and journey, but also because of his LearnSquared course, Organic Sculpting, which is out now. In this episode, Arsene gives us a very honest and surprising insight into his process and explains why his amazing sculptures look the way they do and how all of this fed into his intentions behind his stunning course. I had a great conversation with Arsene and I hope you enjoy it too. Let's go. Hey everyone, welcome to the Learn Squared podcast. And today we have Arsen Asirankulov, who is our newest instructor and teaching organic sculpting. Hey Arsen. Hey, hello. How's it going? Yeah, it's going well, going well. So at this point in time, we are just under 24 hours before the mm -hmm. course launches. How do you feel? Um, I'm, I'm super excited. Uh, like I was really afraid, but then uh, Mohammed reached reached out to me the first time when I was um, still studying at the university. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I thought like I'm 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 not qualified enough to do that. At that time, I wasn't even doing uh, 3D; it was 2D. Wow! And then yeah, and then like two two years after after that, he approached me again, and then like he convinced me <laughs> to do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm, then, I'm glad he convinced you. The course is stunning, um, but your work is stunning. So that alone is a great draw in itself. So it's it's interesting though, because um, we've heard this quite a lot with instructors in the past and maybe just artists in general, where you ask them, like say, to teach or to share knowledge or anything like that. And there is that kind of element of perhaps apprehension or maybe i don't know if you'd say maybe a bit of anxiety in terms of like um ex expressing a workflow or teaching like what what was that like so you mentioned like fear like where did, would you say that stemmed from like what was that what was what was causing that well i thought like the my kind of work is um very applicable to many people mm -hmm. I, I thought uh because I kind of do my own thing and then hope that <laughs> clients hire me and then right uh, like uh, I did not feel like it was justified to te teach that to mm. the people, but then like uh, I thought maybe uh, I just will, and then let it be like let it be part of the universe that that knowledge that like some some knowledge that I acquired. Well, I mean, from my perspective, we just spoke a few moments ago about the course itself, and mm -hmm. like looking at your work. It's so unique. It's so from clearly your world, from your imagination. And mm -hmm. even, even like you can get lost in, in a good way, like just observing all the forms you've created, the, the, um, not even the forms, like the, the entities, the characters that you've built. You get lost in their universe just by looking at you know, like the details and how they, I guess, function because you know, they, they look organic, they look humanoid, but yet they're clearly not human. Um, and it's definitely very much your own voice. And yeah. to put it in a simple way, like you could say they look very complex as well, because there's a lot of like detail going on, a lot of things going on that really attract your attention. 
um, and tell a story unto, unto themselves. So I also expected that because of the the intricacy of some of the designs that you make, and even even the character in the course itself, the sculpture you make in the course itself, uh, I initially my first impression expected that okay, there's going to be some like crazy amount of knowledge to absorb just to apply this. Yeah, I was very surprised in a good way of how simple and approachable like your workflow is. So although if I were to, like say right now, try and emulate and create something that you've made, I'm pretty sure that at the beginning, I won't be able to replicate what you've done because obviously that's from your own imagination. Yet the way you make your things, I can clearly see how I can apply that to my own universe and my own things that I create. So in that sense, like it's quite poetic that the the images you make versus your workflow almost contrast one another and complement one another. Um would you agree with how I've explained that? Uh, yes, yes. Like I always thought that the process, like my process is not very software driven. Mm. It's kind of like a, it's just sculpting. And like the, like you mentioned, it was approachable. I was imagining uh, myself in um, 2016 or 2017. I don't remember like when I started uh, 3D, but um, like I imagined like what kind of knowledge would I pass on to my, uh, like, myself in 20 at that time mm -hmm. and uh, i had some troubles uh picking up the softwares like i tried 3d code and then the tutorials w weren't like very appealing because the end result wasn't something that i resonated with mm -hmm. and then beginner tutorials in zbrush had the same thing like uh I would spend a week doing that, and then at the end, I would have something that I'm not very interesting, not very interested in. Um, and then I kind of pushed through that period, uh, like looking at the beginner tutorials, and then I discovered like Kurt Pep Pepstein's tutorials, uh, mm -hmm. Dominic Quek's tutorials, and then they were sort of like organic, mm -hmm. um, maybe like in some way Giger inspired and then all of that like very organic look and I thought that's very interesting and it still was difficult to follow the tutorial because uh, some of the stuff that uh, like I did not have any knowledge to follow but I was motivated like looking at their end result like how cool like Dominic Quek's alien or like mm. his tutorial was called X head like how cool that looked at the end and i was able kind of to push through that and then i tried to to do a similar thing in this course uh sort of uh like showing all of the things that i know and then um making a sculpture that's sort of uh, at the same level of finish as my own work yeah. but the the approach itself is very simple so that's why um that's why this course starts out as a sort of a beginner course mm -hmm. it's about zbrush ui like what brushes do what's masking what's like dynamesh what's zero measure what if you press t on accident and then yeah. <laughs> you get multiple <laughs> copies of your model on the canvas and uh like super basic stuff because uh i see like a lot of uh, 2D artists that they have they work with form so you basically like mm -hmm. zoom in and then uh, like guide your brush strokes along the form and I had that same re realization I was guiding my strokes along the form and I thought like oh I, I could be doing 3D and then that's how the idea came to my mind that I would I should start 3D nice um it's quite interesting you mentioned that like in a beginner sense you had, uh, I guess, roadblocks and difficulties trying to get going on the 3D software. Um, yeah. Would you say that was more a case of like, was that your first time using 3D overall? Yes, yes. yes. Okay. So would you say that's more a case of just getting used to this new realm of creating? And would you also say that it was perhaps 
the learning curve of the software themselves. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like even the approach, uh, I wasn't used, uh, I was doing 2D. So you just like zoom in, zoom out, but then mm. uh, like I needed to rotate. And then uh, that was like, even rotating was the obstacle for me, like rotating around yeah. the model. Yeah. Uh, but then like maybe since I did not have any experience with 3D software, it was sort of a blessing because I hear people hate ZBrush UI yeah. so much and then I don't understand, like uh, everything was complex. So I kind of picked up ZBrush. And also like I, I like ZBrush because it's it was um, very responsive. It, mm. it, it kind of like it felt good to sculpt there. So maybe that's why I was able to pick it up. Like, I mean, yeah, uh, ZBrush is definitely, I haven't used it for a long, long time, although I did play with it quite a long time ago. Um, mm. And I'm okay with getting on board with software. Like, um, I don't get annoyed with the fact that I have to figure out how the thing works. But mm. when you do go back and forth after a while, like, uh, especially with ZBrush, you do get a bit, uh, thrown off especially if it's not like your main tool um because it's just so different and it's done things in its own way um mm. but then in the course itself obviously you do like you said it's quite useful especially for beginners because those little i guess things that can potentially put people off because they can like can stutter your workflow and really cause obstacles that's all covered but then once that's all done you can get focused on like i guess the the creative side of things right oh, yeah absolutely yeah, and, that's what. Uh, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, please. Uh yeah, that's why there was a sort of a, a beginner part, uh, where you kind of like explain all the tools, and then mm -hmm. we kind of like making the custom UIs so that people didn't, like don't need to spend their time in the sub menus, mm. and then like after that they can focus on their creative side. So, like, because you do mention your custom UI. Personally, mm -hmm. I'm someone who tends not to alter that at all just in case i like ruin it to the point where you know it just becomes unusable um mm -hmm. but how important is it for you to be able to customize your i guess the workbench that you want to work on uh well for the course i was using uh, i was using the standard ui and then right. i put all the buttons that i used the most uh like at the main menu like mm -hmm. at the main window but then uh, for myself, I used the UI it's by the person. His name is Vadim Sadikov. Mm -hmm. He made a ZBrush UI with the pop-up windows. So you press ah. like F2 and then there is a pop-up. I mean like F3, F4, F5. Like, and then on F3, there is a geometry. F4 is like deformation. So I can hide everything and then ah, work definitely. on the clean UI with no buttons. So you mentioned that you've uh, tried uh, 3D Coat and then eventually settled upon ZBrush. Um, yeah. Would you say, like, what, why ZBrush in particular? Um, I guess it was uh, more responsive mm -hmm. because uh, at that time I was a student and I wasn't able to afford a good computer and then I right. was using a very old one. And then my computer wasn't able to cal calculate the voxels. So I would sort of nail the silhouette, like, uh, and then I would want to go to details. And then I was confused by like the surface mode and then the voxel mode mm. there and, oh, uh, by the surface mode and then the voxel mode and like my, and then with ZBrush, I sort of had the sphere and then I would use the move tool and then like I would discover clay tubes and then clay build up and then I would have of a monster but then i would see like oh the polygons are stretching what should i do hmm. and i just like Oop. And then, oh there's a dynamesh so i click on dynamesh and then sculpt 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 and then i realized that it's getting too slow so then i would discover the process called zero meshing and then hmm. i would like copy the sub tool zero mesh it project all detail and then continue working and sort of like discovering a bit by bit it was very important to me when that i um like uh not log in like start the software and then mm. start playing with it immediately mm. and then zbrush felt like it i was able to do that in zbrush i don't know if i answered the questions no no for sure um would you say like i mean it shows because of how many people use it 
um, professionally in their workflow, but would you say it's the go-to sculpting application? Um, I don't know. Many, many people uh, like use different softwares, like yeah. people use softwares on the iPad. Those are very comfortable to use right mm-hmm. now. Um, like Blender, 3D Code. It's just like, uh, I just like ZBrush because it somehow just feels uh, feels better. And it, right. it's the fastest. So it's yeah, like yeah. It a very bad computer, like very old computer and still it's still going to work there. And that, that's, I guess, quite useful when it comes to professional and client work as well, right? The fact that it's fast and reliable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's fast, responsive. It's, it has weird UI, but <laughs> it's okay. it can handle like 100 million polygons and it's, it's, it works. And works like- we always get this question uh, multiple times whenever we have a course launch, particularly when it's um, linked to... So like a particular kind of look, which is obviously like your how your work is, um, mm-hmm. and especially in the discipline of sculpting, where it's quite specialist. Um, people do mention like which is the best software. I guess there could be many reasons behind this. A lot of it is just people wanting to know what it is out of curiosity, whether they have the right tools and if they can use different ones. Um, mm-hmm. Like, what's your take on that? Like, how would you say for anybody who doesn't have ZBrush, like how would they still be able to apply? your teaching, especially on the sculpting side of things? Uh, well, they maybe could learn some creative things in there because uh, I sort of uh, show my creative process as well mm-hmm. from gathering references, uh, like building the, that reference board mm-hmm. and then making sketches. I also showed the different, uh, like different ways that I sketch, like sym- symmetrical approach, non-symmetrical approach, mm-hmm uh they can use that and then make a sketch and then just follow the tutorial and then use their their software that they have uh, uh, which yeah. ones would you say are let, let's say for example zebras just stop working tomorrow for you mm-hmm. do you have any others that you kind of fall back on like say a backup plan or of you that you know that other other professionals use that potentially could achieve a similar similar result well, if ZBrush wasn't working, I know people use Blender because you can. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So the sculpting there is quite good. Uh, the so like iPad, like the mobile ones, Forger. Yes, people yeah. do incredible stuff in there. Like, and uh, also I use uh, like I recently started using VR sculpting. Nice. Yeah, so I would probably use that. Mm-hmm. Uh, like VR sculpting, um, it's not really. Um, I haven't discovered any um, advantages over ZBrush. Right. I'm, I'm like very emotionally driven person. <laughs> so it's like it 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 just feels good, like feeling that that surface in in 3D, mm. and uh, it sort of forces. Uh, like I I recently having my like. Uh, rediscovery with sculpting and then like looking at the primary forms uh, mm-hmm. and then the sculpting in, in VR sort of forces you not to move into detailing too fast. Mm. So I would say I would go for VR sculpting plus another software to add details. Right, right. But other than that, I, I would still use ZBrush. It's like so fast. Oh. And once you get hang of this, uh, hang of it, it's it's even faster. So. so I guess it's cool for people who are wondering that essentially as long as you're comfortable with a particular package or you have anything on hand, that should still be enough, right? At least to get going. And then obviously once they start getting deeper and deeper into things, that's when they can really find their own lane into their appropriate or desired tool, right? Yeah, of course. Because uh, I feel like the people don't need to do uh, like a complex character because uh um, Momo showed the brief builder, like yeah, every yes. course has a brief builder here. And then um, like my characters, it's, it's basically like a prop. <laughs> so with a, with a head, yeah. <laughs> because it's like abstract body sort of resembling a human one and the, uh, like a human face just to relate to it. And then uh, I could do the same with, I could like design swords and like, like alter something like that. And then people could do that. It doesn't need to be like a super complex thing. Plus like after ZBrush, we still use different softwares like Substance and Blender. Yes. So 
I think they people could could apply that knowledge. Oh, for sure. Like if and one cool thing I like, well, it's not even what I like. It's quite common we see with students with a, any particular course. Um, some will follow exactly what the course teaches, um, which which is obviously cool um, because the stuff that you learn is just going to be awesome anyway, and the end result is always great. And then you see students who just completely do a 180 and take it in a completely different direction, but you can clearly see where they've applied that. And for me, this is my take on it. So forgive me if I'm completely missing the mark, but mm-hmm. when I see your work, and I mentioned this obviously earlier as well, it's like you can just clearly see that it's a snapshot or an insight into, well, you maybe not your world, but your creative world and the universe that you create for your 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 um, sculpts. Um, mm-hmm. And by the same by the same definition. Um, other artists and their own worlds and their creations or whatever they're making can clearly apply that. Even if it doesn't look the same aesthetic, they can clearly see, um, at least from my take on watching the course, you can just, the way you break down the tools and how you apply it and your theory behind it. It's, you can clearly see that it can be taken in any particular discipline or subject matter and it's still going to come out awesome. That's my take on it. Yeah, uh, I would agree because uh, if we break down the image to its like simplest component, it's a silhouette or basically like shape color. Mm-hmm. And then you, if you take my sculpt and then change the primary shape and then change, let's say, like a tertiary shape. So for mm-hmm. example, primary shape would be something stylized and then tertiary shape instead of uh, like a very organic wavy stuff that I'm doing. Mm-hmm add some some geometric patterns in there and then it's going to be a completely different look but then the same knowledge from the course yeah. could be applied there and so you, you mentioned that you're doing like sculpting that's traditional sculpts right uh yeah I, I do a bit but um i studied oil painting in university so oh ah, cool like i yeah. would have the way you sculpt like i would have i had, or it would not have been surprised that you sculpted traditionally initially um mm-hmm. So that makes me ask, like, where did the interest or where was like the pull to want to create sculpts and in mm-hmm. 3D? Uh, well, when I started out, um, I can like basically tell that that story. Um, so I was uh, studying architecture in China. And then after two years, I discovered that really my not my thing. Mm. but. Um, like, do you know a manga is called Blame? I've like, heard of it. I've yet to see it. Yeah, by by Tsutomu Nihei. Yeah. So he was an architect, and when like when I was studying in school, I thought like, well, I'm an artistic, but I kind of have good grades. So, and then my my parents like said that I should study architecture, and I I'm looking at Tsutomu Nihei's man- manga, and then like I re- I discovered that he was an architect as well. Cool. So I thought, okay, I can like be an architect and then maybe in my free time pursue art but then after two years i wasn't able to like i did i really did not like it so (laughs) after that i changed my major to oil painting and then started over and at the start i was sort of a 2d purist like oh i need to do like everything 2d Mm. it's like uh, i'll paint everything and then i was trying to be sort of a like a standard kind of uh artist for games yeah. so i was like okay i'm gonna make a medieval knight i'm gonna make a i don't know a castle and then and then a well basic stuff that, that yeah, will get yeah. you fired but then i realized that kind of like my my love for that was uh, like it's not really what i love to do mm. so i tried to like sit and then write down the things that I love. And then it was like Giger and then like all the figurines by Japanese artists mm-hmm. like Takayuki Takeya and uh, Yasushi Nirasawa. Basically all the guys that did um, Super Sentai stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you like, if you imagine the uh, Power Rangers and mm-hmm. the evil guys, the way they looked. Yeah, yeah, yeah who designed that stuff and then they were influenced by Giger as well so that's kind of a 
interesting. So it went from the west to the east, and then now yep. back to the west. Wow. So I was looking at their stuff, and then uh, I was like hugely inspired by them. Plus uh, Giger himself, like Bixinski. I was looking at a lot of uh, Art Nouveau stuff, mm -hmm. and I thought like maybe I would do this kind of stuff. Oh, and then um, Ranja, like a Chinese mm -hmm. artist. Yes. I, I was looking at his stuff and seeing like that ornamental looking armors yeah. that he made for legend of cryptids so i thought like maybe if it, if that character like that ornamental stuff as part of his body but not an armor so like i started tinkering with that and then i did these uh power ranger fan arts and then like when doing the red power rangers i realized when i was zooming in and then rendering that chest muscle like that was my realization that i could start doing 3d Mm. And then after that, I sort of dove into that genre. And then yeah, I guess I, that was your question, right? How I started through 3D. <laughs> wow. I mean, it's quite interesting that, that the fact that you went from, although I believe, and like, you know, any, anything design or anything creative, they're, they're, they're all interlinked in one way or another. And um, they all mm. tap into like similar uh, philosophies and workflows and, you know, like, um, motivations however they're still clearly quite different when you look at them in terms of their finished form um mm -hmm. so when you were doing architecture was like painting something that you did in a spare time or was that something you never even touched uh when i was doing architecture i was like it it was it was it's called the major was called like architecture engineer so it was yeah. a lot of calculations involved right. and okay yeah uh, yeah, honestly, I did not even know that it was architecture engineering because I was studying in China. Mm -hmm. And then because like uh, I was applying for that and then I saw like the major is called Tianru in Chinese. And then right. uh, and basically it's translated as architecture, but in my university it was architecture engineering. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like the stuff that I was learning there, it wasn't really inspiring, but yeah i don't know how that influenced but yeah not much of the architecture influence but um i was i was just drawing in my spare time mm. so basically if we had an assignment to do sketches i would do like a lot more of sketches and drawings right. spent most of the, of my time doing that and uh yeah i guess at that time i realized that uh, I'm more interested in that thing and then I, later i discovered like lord, lord of the rings um extra material like behind oh, the scenes and then think of concept artists <laughs> and then the, the rest is history so from when you decided that architecture is no longer for you mm -hmm. up until the point where you decided that you now want to do like where you're at now or like sculpting at least um, mm -hmm. what was that time difference like how, how long did that take so um i'm 27 now in 20 graduated high school 2010 i spent one year studying chinese and then two years studying um architecture so at the second um uh, second year of architecture i realized that i did not want it and then in 2014, I started with uh, do, I started doing art. Oh, yeah. I, and then, I like that how um, I'm sure it wasn't like nice for you at the time or when it was happening, but I like how that you kind of listened to that voice inside of you, like what is what you want to do, and even then it might not have been clear, but you tried the various different things to settle upon. I'm sure like it's never really settled, right? It's always potentially can change in the future. No. Um, but like you got to that place where you're creating, I guess, the things that are really, not only that you want to create, but they, I'm sure, are tapping into that place of creativity where just things click and you kind of can explore more and more and more. Um, and I think it's quite eye-opening as well because, and I've been through something similar and in my experience, I was more trying to resist wanting to change because I thought that's me trying to um, get out of doing something and potentially failing at it. 
So then I kind of perhaps forced it longer than I should have. Um, so it's it's quite interesting to show that if someone does get an anxiety at a point in time where they think they're not doing the right thing, but then they fear that if they change, they're kind of starting back from, you know, like square one and it might never happen again, that it's, that there's nothing to fear in that sense, that you can still find your calling and there's no harm in starting again um, and continuing forwards. Yeah, so I like, agree. Yeah, where would you, like, just before we touch more upon to the course, um, mm-hmm. where do you see yourself forward, like, in the future in terms of, like, do you have other things in the pipeline that you want to explore um, or are you kind of happy in the, in the zone that you're in right now? Uh, well, I don't know, like, you mentioned the anxiety and then mm-hmm. that, that um, drive for change. Uh, I always have that. Like, uh, um, even after I graduated, uh, I went back to my own country, like Kyrgyzstan, Mm -hmm. spent uh, one year there, like building portfolio, working on some clients. And then I had that inkling that I wanted to like explore, explore some other things, uh, like, um, like bringing the sculptures into physical world and then doing like 3d printing and then. Uh, I decided to go to Russia to study for uh, metal smithing. Cool. Uh, yeah. And then um, to sort of like uh, 3D print my stuff and then like cast it in bronze and then sort of do that same thing that I do gi- digitally, but traditionally right. wasn't very successful because, uh, but uh, wasn't very successful with that. But like it's, I'm like always, always uh, kind of like anxious about the change. Like even even now, mm. uh, the stuff that I'm doing now, like I'm I'm trying to go away with the <laughs> with the thing that I I taught in this course. Right. Uh, I remember like Maché's. Like I, I listened to a lot. Uh, like I, I listened to Maché and then Ash when I was uh, starting out a lot, and then he was like mentioning the thing like emptying the emptying the ball like emptying the cup like yes. you're like basically sharing all of your knowledge that yes. basically that i did for this course and then now i'm sort of um uh, trying to do something different not like entirely different maybe not in terms of the style but mm-hmm. in terms of my approach to it because um people see the renders they spent like a couple seconds maybe if you're lucky a minute uh, looking mm-hmm. at it yes but i'm spending a month doing that and then i feel like the um the pro the process is uh very important as well so now i'm sort of <laughs> changing my process now and kind of having some some pains with that learning well, pains normally that's a good thing right like with the growing pains because once you do get that click um as i'm sure you're aware that that's when you know it goes crazier in a good way yeah yeah absolutely so the metalsmith thing, like what happened with that? Uh, well, basically like the moment that I started uh, working on that, it's, um, well, I wasn't very happy with the education system, mm. uh, sort of uh, aimed at people who don't have art education and maybe uh, wasn't very established. Um, okay. Not established, like don't have their own style. So they sort of try to remake you a bit. And yeah, I wasn't yeah. look, very looking into that. I was only like trying to learn techniques to bring my own uh, mm-hmm. stuff into physical world. But then, like, I had to like uh, battle with the with those teachers on oh, that nice. kind of losing. <laughs> so uh, I have like now it's my second year, so I'm gonna finish it soon. And yeah. is that something you want to potentially branch off and expand on your own, or is that something that's probably gonna? put that chapter behind you for the time being well the one positive thing that i i got from it is that um like i, I talked there with uh y- younger teachers and they kind of uh brought me to their own workshop showed the, all the equipment and the ways to learn gave me books so now um uh, i realized that you can basically do that thing on your own as well mm. so traditional medium like we have that the thing that 
like okay oil painting i can set up the easel maybe yeah. like some translation and i can paint pictures but then when people look at the jewelry and then sculptures and then yes. think about all the complex processes of casting and then molding and all of that that it's it's complex but it's actually can be done at home as well so yeah. i'm excited to kind of um do everything on on my own right now and like I'm definitely liking the process of uh, like self-teaching. Mm. It's much more enjoyable than than doing it in formal educate like institutions. Yeah, um, similar experience with myself. Um, mm. Although I've had like it's a bit of mixed bag um, where I've had some places in like institutions. Most of it was because over here, like legally, you expected to go to these places, and then you know university and what have you. Um, it's like you know a preset or like a preset structure that most people follow because it's presumed to have um like you know get you a job and all that kind of stuff um but then when i did it it was like during the last recession like around about 2010 2008 um so it kind of became kind of pointless going down that route um, but nevertheless um there were some teachers in like college i had that completely were amazing and just are responsible for where I'm at today. And then I've also had that experience where in the educational system, it just never clicked. And it was just like, yeah. but you got there with your hands open, you're kind of trying to find out where do I get the knowledge from? And by, by before you know it, it's over. Um, and yet when I've started to learn myself or, you know, self-initiated learning, like trying to hunt for the things that I want to learn about. Yeah. And then you find like, techniques you never thought you wanted to learn about and that really helps you i've leveled up in an exponential way compared to the linear structure that institutional education offers um Mm. and as a result of that it's given me the impression or the conclusion that especially when it comes to the creative field um that may be the most powerful way like for sure supplement it with like courses and learning from you know, experts and mentors, that's always going to be key. Um, but because creativity can branch off into any avenue it wants, um, there's clearly never going to be a set way. So it, it's important to embrace, you know, like self-learning and because we, I'm sure you'll agree when you learn self-learning, you learn more about yourself as well, as opposed oh. to just the craft you're learning and think, oh, that's why that never clicked at university or there because I prefer to learn in this way. And things like that right yeah yeah because like you can you can choose who you follow mm. like uh, every like all of my favorite artists are also my teachers mm. like that and then like like being self-taught is not very correct term like self-initiated learning that the way yes. you said it works better because uh, i doubt that i would do anything without the books and then the courses and the podcasts that like people kindly provided like for free or paid ones that um yeah that that type of learning is it's much better because uh, a person can sort of look at himself or herself and then like look at themselves and then investigate their their own like like look at their own feelings Mm -hmm. and like pick the the instructor or like someone to follow like to learn from like on their own for sure i mean like imagine it university um, or in most places, you have a limited pool of people you can learn from. And for the most part, you are told who you have to learn from. Um, yeah. And here, like now, especially in this age, like you said, you, you almost kind of interview the people that you want to learn from um, before you start learning from them. And a lot of the time, like you said, with podcasts and uh, uh, for me, like most people I've learned from and how I ended up in Learn Squared was through things like live streams, podcasts, finding out what they're about. And then realizing that, okay, this, this actually clicks with me um, and other places also. And mm. this is like a great age, especially for creativity to learn from, although there's a lot of information and some of it's not as good as others. Um, there's still some great information out there. And the fact that there's so many great artists out there and they're accessible and you don't have to go to a particular city um to stay there spend x amount of money to learn from those people that is just like has been a game changer i think yeah no absolutely i agree 100 percent. so back to um like again getting your 
sculpts now back in like you know metal and bronze and that kind of stuff that seems perfect is there sort of like a perfect um way to showcase your art and your creations um linking back to the lord of the rings trilogy especially the making of one of the coolest things that i took from that was i was amazed because you always knew that like props and weapons are fake in films yet yeah. they actually made them for real and that was like <clears throat> that added more value from when i saw those props in the film knowing that you know like i know not some scenes were had the actual like swords but the fact that you know like the actors were taught how to wield swords and you know you had actual blacksmiths making them it yeah. just added that layer of authenticity um and even like obviously with lord of the rings you know like every race has their own identity in terms of you know the visual language and how that imbues into the actual weapons and the props and everything themselves um mm. the same can be said about like i keep referring it to your world because you know like your 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 sculpt your sculptures so of visceral um they just completely stand out they capture your attention and they they seem to have a story behind them and when i look at them i don't see i don't like sometimes when you look at art you know like, okay i'm looking at this cool sculpture i'm looking at this cool rendering i'm looking at this cool 3d model when i look at your work that's not what comes to my mind first i'm looking at this you know the, the character and even then the name like you know you, that's the only thing you can hang off um as an entry point into that particular piece um then you realize that oh, okay this is a sculpt and this is how it was done and etc cetera, etc cetera. um so i definitely want to congratulate you in that how you've been able to well bring your sculptures to life so my question is is that how deliberate is that and how much of that has been just simply practicing and um just working on your craft like uh like the world building or or uh, what i guess kind of well yeah i guess it's like laid like quite a laid question in the sense of like when you're creating your sculptures um is there like in the back of your mind or in the forefront of your mind of like how realistic or how well i guess not realistic but bringing them to life right like they they seem to be actual things in my eyes um as opposed to a creation um so how deliberate is that in that sense uh i feel like it's uh it's quite deliberate uh mm. i'm very happy that you said that they feel like the actual things because uh i don't have um much of a like in my own personal work i don't have a world building in my mind when i do that mm. uh i sort of uh imagine them as part of the part of this world like ah, okay, cool. uh, kind of the, the reason why they float in the like the that empty blank space in darkness because they kind of uh uh live inside of the 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 imagination when you close your eyes and then it's dark and then there's kind of that that figure appears from the darkness Sick. and it's kind of uh sort of uh, I, I was um using the sculpture sort of as a way to do sort of a self therapy uh mm. because like uh I was in China and I was uh, like super lonely because uh, I, I spoke Chinese, but it was very like basic. So mm. uh, no like super close uh, uh, meaningful relationships in there. So I was kind of like, and uh, since I uh, like, again, but going back to that anxiety question, like uh, I switched my majors. So I thought that I'm in some sort of a race mm. that, oh, I like, spent one year of learning Chinese, two years of architecture. Now I need to, like uh like chase the skill i need to like spend my whole time in there and i was i became quite like sad and kind of like doing these sculpts was sort of a a ways of like coping with those emotions mm. so uh that's kind of like I, I would like close my eyes and then i would like when I was feeling a certain way, I would close my eyes and then I would tie, like try to uh, tie a, a visual representation of the emotion that I felt at that moment. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the the way all those things were born. And uh, 
yeah, that's why it's kind of like darkness because I was like sitting there with my eyes closed and then like, I guess my processing power of my brain was only able to like render only like one figure <laughs> in darkness. I mean, that's, that's interesting that it's linked to a lot about obviously your like psychology and <clears throat> your personal experiences. And even like say in a visual sense, it's great because it just makes them pop. Like the focus is on the, you know, the, the creatures, the characters, uh, the figures themselves. Um, mm. So it's like, it works well in both. And now that you mentioned about how you're feeling, it definitely, at least with my interpretation, it shows now because, you know, like some of them have eyes either covered or, you know, like obscured and some is the mouth and, you know, that kind of stuff. And you can kind of, easily see how that potentially could be an emotion or a feeling or things like that you know mm -hmm. like um going forward so that's one of the cool things about what i like about your work is because it is definitely not surface level there's a lot more oh. to it and let like, neither just mentioned that it definitely definitely shows um so this this like visual style that you have was that well Part of it, you've answered because it wasn't, it was deliberate in the sense that you're trying to tap into how you were feeling and, you know, like, like closing your eyes, et cetera. But yet, at the same time, it wasn't like pre calculated. Um, so, how did you settle upon this particular aesthetic that you have? Uh, well, uh, it kind of goes back to my childhood. Mm -hmm. um, I was kind of, uh, I was a bit weird. So, um, I used to get scared by my older siblings, like mm -hmm. uh, when my par like uh, uh, when we go visit the the siblings, like my cousins, they were a lot older, and the house that they lived in was quite like big, and then had like a lot of dark, scary places. Mm -hmm. So they would scare me a lot, and, and like tell me a lot of scary stories, and then that would scare me. But then I would watch like a, a movie alien or predator and then that uh, like the predator was incredibly appealing character to me mm. and then like the alien as well uh, i don't know it's probably like that exploration of your shadow side like i felt comfort mm. looking at those scary mysterious creatures that maybe like I, if i if i could somehow relate to them i wouldn't be scared of darkness maybe mm. and that's how it kind of came about with this uh darker aesthetic and that's why i'm um uh that's why i like uh giger and then bixinski yeah. uh, like but al these artists it's quite interesting you mentioned that like i guess in a way facing fears um mm -hmm. have you seen or heard of the film the witch the uh, I haven't watched a single uh, horror movie in my life. <laughs> oh, okay. Wow. Um, well, like, I guess you could call Alien and Predator kind of horror, but that's more like sci-fi. Um, but no, I'm the same. Like, personally, I avoid horror films. I don't like being scared. I don't like all that kind of stuff, especially when it's deliberately trying to scare you. Um, yeah. I don't, I'm not into that. However, um, The Witch is it's quite a different type of film. It's very like, if you like, like cinema and cinematography and all that kind of stuff. It's, it ticks all those boxes. It's not like your, if I'm, at least my opinion, it's not like your generic run of the mill, you know, like a slasher type film or monsters, etc. cetera. And um, obviously it's in the title, it's about a witch. Um, but the director, um, his name escapes me now, uh, but he also did the film Lighthouse with Robert Pattinson in there um, more recently. But anyway, yeah. like he, his aesthetic is kind of like, like, like you mentioned, like the shadow side, the dark side, um, but not in a way where it's pure horror, although the witch like scared the shit out of me when I watched it. Um, but yeah, it's beautifully shot. I think he's natural light, all that kind of stuff. Um, it was set, I think, like when the settlers came to America um, or the pilgrims, I believe. Um, so what he actually based that film off real life diary excerpts um taken from that time so um oh. if i'm correct every word that's spoken in there is actually written by someone that existed from that time which i think is quite 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 cool 
the set yeah, and the the house where everything's built they use the traditional manufacturing techniques of that era um and they uh, like i mentioned they also use the speech mm-hmm. so it's very authentic experience um wow. but nevertheless the director it's a long way of me just getting to this point um mm-hmm. but the director himself said he was scared of witches like growing up like you said yourself like it was a recurring nightmare it was a recurring theme but he goes once he made that film he mm-hmm. no longer had that nightmare anymore oh wow that's interesting so it, it's almost interesting right. like that i guess in one way to interpret it the the horror or that that um that monster that lived inside of his subconscious mm-hmm. he extracted it and now it's no longer there anymore almost like an exorcism of sorts um if you want to look at it that way so that i thought for me that made the film even more awesome um because i like digging you know when i like something i like to see how it was made and if there's an authentic or like a genuine creative drive behind that creation that makes it even more awesome for me um mm. and then how you mentioned that how your work is is that for me reminded how he felt about his stuff um and i can relate like, there's certain things i remember growing up where for some reason, well, not not some reason, it was because of the film It, I was scared of clowns. And oh, I was yeah. always scared of vampires. I always thought they were under my bed. Yeah. When you get older, like, you know, you think that's, that's ridiculous. But I just <laughs> remember that fear, like, yeah. as a kid, that there's something out there and it's going to get me. And I know it's under my bed or things like that. It's so real when you were a kid. It's that, that's. I'm, I'm also scared of witches and the grandmas because of Mulholland Drive. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah, we had a cable TV and I would flip the channels and then I would look and then, especially in the night, and there would be something like scary, like old grandma just sleeping near that <laughs> hero. Yeah, there's, there's something about the creative mind and darkness, like it really makes that hyperactive and you just imagine all sorts of stuff. Oh, yeah. So oh, like yeah. with, um, I mean, you mentioned like Giga, like Giga's, you can clearly see that the influence that Giga has in, in terms of like, your work but nevertheless i think who who hasn't inspired oh, yeah. in terms of like he's it's, it's still to this day so iconic and unique and i remember like similar to yourself when i saw alien for the first time and even when you see it now like if you've never seen the film before when you mm-hmm. see that the xenomorph um like and i still like the fact that it doesn't have an official name like it never, it's been given a name, but it's never had an official title and official name, which I think mm-hmm. adds to lore even more. Um, but it's just like, it's a proper creature, it's a proper monster. It's still an alien. It's it ticks all the boxes in terms of like what you want. Um, I guess like a a evil creature to be like. Um, mm-hmm. And then digging deeper, when when I saw like how he was chosen for the film, and then. I discovered, I believe it's Necronomicon, his, his book. Yes. Mm-hmm. And even to this day, when I look at it, it disturbs me more than it does intrigue me, but I can't get my eyes off it because of like, it is like nightmarish and it's yeah. like a, a fossilized nightmare mm-hmm. there for you to see. Um, so it's, it, it's quite like amazing that how art can have an impact, especially from, an individual's mind what's oh, your yeah. take on gig and, and what is it about him that has inspired you uh hmm. like he was quite honest with with his art he wasn't like mm. hiding anything like uh there was a lot of like sexual stuff yeah. in, in and Xenom- like if, well xenomorph's head is basically like a, a fel- yeah fel- yeah, fel- <laughs> yeah attached to a head it's it's um yeah like his his honesty and like uh he was uh i remember like from interviews i think uh i was um i don't remember which which movie was that it was either a giger like dark star or uh yodorovsky's dune one of those documentaries mm-hmm. where they describe giger as being like tortured by nightmares and then mm-hmm. like taking opium to avoid those so I feel like if you have such a visceral response to to that, and then you are still like choosing to put that on canvas to face it, mm. that's kind of a like his bravery. Maybe that's that's what 
that what inspired me. And also like sadness maybe mm. with because like after Alien it wasn't like very wasn't like the that the next creature wasn't very good. And like the I would look at behind the scenes of the Prometheus and then the sketches that he did for those wasn't like very appealing. So I have like the I have the image of young Giger in my head. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Uh, well, well it's I, I agree. It's like um I think in the later films it was more designed. Where I think in the first one it was definitely his I know it was obviously guided by Ridley and you know, like I guess the powers that be in terms of how they want to little tweaks here and there. But that was definitely, I guess, probably more honest in terms of his imagination. Yeah. So, like, with your work now, when you mm -hmm. come to create, when you start a sculpt, like, what is your first phase? And I guess this ties into the course as well, because I know, I know you, like, started with a sketch. But mm -hmm. in terms of, like, say, on the philosophical side, or more so, like, the idea side, what triggers a piece for you uh well when i do my personal work uh i usually have a folder with sketches and those are extremely rough rough mm. and uh sort of try to um like tackle the subjects connect like connected to my own life and then paint them in very archetypical way like uh and then I, I just sort of make a sketch and then uh, just go from there with uh, with my personal work. Mm -hmm. But if I if I work for clients, uh, I usually do a lot of studies, um, like study the brief, mm -hmm. um, try to find like interesting cultural references. And like with my own stuff, I'm very unstructured, but when I do client stuff, uh, I try to pull a lot of uh, like ancient things that like basically old art is yeah. is good art because like I managed to, to reach us like from yes. the millennia. So uh, I look at that and add my own stuff in there and kind of like go from there. But the the process that it's in the course is it's the same to to mine. Uh, it's mine is uh, usually a little more chaotic. in there uh, i i sketched it and then i kind of follow the sketch closely and mm -hmm. then only after that i i change it but with my own personal work the sketches are a little more chaotic but i did that on purpose for the course so that people would were able to follow it a little more easily and i also like like the type of references you choose as well um although i most references are from real world stuff anyway um at least most professional artists do that um mm -hmm. it's also cool to see that it was you know, like like I said you did select art but it was i saw like a lot of museum artifacts or like you know like ancient or archaeological pieces right um mm -hmm. with a mixture of like fashion and all these different kind of a fusion of all these different um like sources of inspiration mm -hmm. but it's pretty cool to see that it wasn't inspired by another artist's art or a little more like contemporary art in terms of like the concept art or what have you or like an existing ip it's from these like very raw ingredients that you choose to make obviously your art um is that something that's deliberate or is that just what what you're drawn to uh i'm just drawn to like uh old art it's, it's so mysterious it's like yeah. those ancient people with the most basic tools were able to do mm. like incredible things and like it's just like mind-boggling what they were able to to achieve and like it's kind of like le looking at their stuff i feel like privileged doing mm. that so that's kind of why uh, i pull from those references and uh, uh on the topic of references as well like uh, in the course I, s I i don't hide the reference board yes so I, I i i show like where i pull like what kind of things so um I feel like well I'd imagine like uh, many people who will take the course would know like the basics of like image that you can like break it down to the silhouette mm -hmm. color and design that you can take like separate elements from those things that's why the reference might seem random at first like I'm making this character and they have a cactus in there <laughs> so 
but uh, the the shape of that cactus would be like used on the chest of the character, and then you would add some of the modern fashion in there, and then kind of like tie that into the main idea. Mm. Yeah, and with um, sketching, obviously you mentioned that when it comes to personal work, um, mm-hmm. it's more I guess loose and it's more. Would you say if I got this correct? It's more like you jump from your own sketches straight into the sculpt. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Um, so like how important is sketching for you? And do you ever jump straight into a sculpt without any sketch? Um, like jumping, um, I sometimes do that, but mm-hmm. I feel like when I jump to the sculpt immediately, I usually like for some reason I just do my go-to techniques kind of. Mm. <laughs> um, but with a sketch, it's so easy. Like you make a like couple of lines and your your brain sort of like continues like mm. uh builds the rest of the image so i feel like the sketches are are very important because it's it's, it's very easy to like do a couple of scribbles and then like uh sort of go from there mm-hmm. and like um well with sk- yeah, sketches are are easier if you are trying to explore a certain idea, right. because um, there is. I feel like with digital, you got this like complex machine in front of you, mm-hmm. and the, with tons of buttons, and then you have like uh, like uh, a browser with the internet at your disposal, and sketching feels a little more meditative. Mm. Um, like for the course, I did the tra- uh, the digital ones. Yeah, uh, but uh, I also do a lot of traditional ones. So you can just like sit in your bed and then in the coffee shop. Yeah. It's much more. Uh, it's much more intimate with with that, like uh, alone with your thoughts. It feels and like there is no pressure of making it good. Mm. The, the most important part is like uh, bringing those ideas from your subconscious. So. I feel like sketching is important, but uh, I see people do digital and like they jump straight into digital mm-hmm. and they do incredible work. So I guess mm-hmm. that's just a personal preference. Um, with your sketch, mm-hmm. but before you go, when you when you take it to a sculpt, like do you? And I guess it might, might be different different cases. So it might be a case of yes to to all of them. Um, but is it more a case of like the sketches almost like? Skeletor, and you build off of that, or do you try and like stay true to the sketch? And if so, does that make the sculpting part a bit difficult at times? Because obviously, you're going from 2D to 3D different dimensions. Um, does that cause any roadblocks, or on the flip side, it actually creates more opportunities? Uh, I feel like the you, you kind of nailed it. It's it's, it's scale, skeletal. So um, it's that initial spark that gave that idea, but uh the things in the sketch is not gonna look good in 3d necessarily mm. but that that like initial thing that like oh this is this is good i'm gonna use that one uh this feeling like kind of translates in the sculpture even if it's changes even if it changes so mm. uh yeah the sketch is it's very like skeletal mm. and that's so that's the first lesson um mm-hmm. in the second lesson that's where you begin the actual sculpt and obviously you can mention before um the second lesson is very detailed in the sense that you get your lowdown of actually how to use your preferred sculpting software which is zbrush um and then obviously onto the sculpt itself and that is one of the parts that i really enjoyed because like i said like i said i'm definitely a fan of appreciating your work in its finished form but i also mm-hmm. really enjoyed watching how you create your 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 sculpts as well because obviously that's when you start looking at it from an artist to artist point of view and then you see like oh that that's quite cool that's a great decision to do there i initially thought that would have been a different solution um so like how how has that sculpting process been refined over the years um to where it is now um finding of the process i feel like um the volume control sort of got um, easier. So if I imagine a certain shape, it's it's kind of a with practice, it's easier to uh, 
like sculpt that shape. Yeah. Uh, so sort of a familiarity with the with the medium. Uh, also, the other part of the refinement is uh, generally being playful with the sculpting process and being less. Uh, so if I sculpt it, uh, I can just delete it and re-sculpt mm. it. It's it's kind of like being comfortable that with this digital medium and not being afraid to like use and abuse it. So mm. uh, I, I I don't know if it answers your. Oh no, your no, question. it is. Um, and you did mention earlier that you do um, traditional sculpts as well, or you've attempted to. Uh, just uh, just a little bit when I was doing right. 2D. Um, I was uh, I had a hard time like nailing the cast shadows and then how would they work on form so I would right. just do uh, a sketch in um sketchbook pro like symmetrical one and then uh, make uh like at that time the Simon Lee released his course uh on Stan Winston uh, school yeah so I got the subscription watched his course and then just followed his process of building the armature and then just like uh like putting clay on top of that, mm-hmm. and then I would like post this little figure, make a rudimentary environment out of the like cardboard box. Yeah. If I uh, needed some drapery, I would just grab a, uh, I would just grab a cheap paper and then like crumble it. Yeah. And then just kind of shape it as a, uh, as a cloak or something like that. So I guess that was my <laughs> use of uh, traditional sculpture. And has that fed into your digital sculpts in a significant way? Um, I'm not sure at that time I wasn't, uh, I wasn't really thinking about digital sculpture. Like, uh, even recently, since I come with, come uh, from the 2d background, yeah. I wasn't really like paying attention on the, like one of the most important parts of sculpting. It's actually like the, looking at the highlight and the way mm. it like, uh, shows you the form like the highlight and the silhouette and then uh, prior to that i was using like drop shadows to mm-hmm. to and the silhouette to like calculate the way it would look in 3d space yeah yeah so i uh, wasn't really uh, did not very like influence me a lot so like in that lesson itself um mm-hmm. although that's where i guess most of the hard work is done because that's where yes. the sculpt is is formed um, yes. like I said, from my, my experience from watching the course, it, like I said, I was taken aback by how easy it is to follow. Um, and that's a testament to obviously your workflow and how you taught it as well. Um, and then the next step after that was obviously the texturing part. Um, and your preferred tool for that one is substance painter, right? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, that part I was, uh, that's kind of like one of the reasons why I was a bit hesitant to share my process. I, mm-hmm. I'm doing 3D, but I'm doing everything wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I see like uh, artists who just transition from 2D to 3D. They just generally take a key shot and then just do a, like a key shot pass, maybe do a pass with different materials, paint out the stuff that you don't need. But yeah. I really wanted to paint on top of the model, like playing with the different materials. So that's why I kind of chose that way. Um, it It's super wrong, <laughs> it's so, but it's just only, it's only way to avoid key shot. Like, so I, I just um, use poly paint uh, and then I, I just like s- do seams on the model. Yeah. And I don't really know if they're right. <laughs> I just try to hide the seams. Um, and make the UV islands flat, but they might be wrong, but it kind of works. So uh, I use a UV master. Oh, no, uh, I use a polygroup it plugin in ZBrush. Mm-hmm. So you basically uh, do a lines on your sculpt uh, with a like a black paint and then click on polygroup it. It, uh, it groups it into different polygroups. And then on UV master, you just click on unwrap. And it unwraps your whole model, and you just do it oh, each subtool one by one, and after that you, you you just bring it to Substance Painter. And like, why uh, or what ended up um, you picking Substance Painter eventually? Well, there's not many other 
softers that do that, right? I know Mari's one, but that's like a different kettle of fish, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I think there was an armor pit as well, but oh yes, uh, yes. Yeah, at the time, I think it only started out. So, yeah. But I like I use substance a lot in my workflow, and mm-hmm. partly is similar to what you mentioned as well, like the fact that you can just paint directly on the model itself, as mm-hmm. opposed to having to do paint overs afterwards. Um, yeah. But I think that is probably one of the reasons why your sculpts look amazing because I was very, again, surprised that when it does get to Photoshop, the, I believe there's zero paint over, right? Uh, just At least like in the ones the, for the course? Yeah, like I, I like add some shadows in there. Uh, I did a very bad job on the hair, so I just like re, repainted a ha- some hairs. Yeah. That's basically it. And like some color cor- correction, but not much work. Like the texturing process and then the rendering process, they're all uh, driven by the sculpt itself. Mm. Because uh, like during the texturing process, using the masks uh, that, like the mask that use cavity maps, mm-hmm. and uh, the cavity maps are basically like uh, extracted from the sculpt. So, yeah, that was uh, fairly easy. I guess yeah. those like chapter three, chapter four, are, like fairly easy. I guess mm. the hardest part is uh, lesson two, where the bulk of it is ZBrush. And like with them, substance painter itself, because obviously it's mm-hmm. like it's a bit like Keisha, where you just drag and drop your materials, right? But obviously, yeah. you, you have more nuance because you can really control what the material does and where you apply like certain details and colors and textures and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so like. When you come to choosing materials, what decides it for you? Like, is it more so? Because I know you do initially start with like with a preset in um, Substance Painter, then you start adding your own flair to it. Um, yeah. But like, where does your inspiration come from in terms of how your sculpt will look? Because the, at the same time, they're very otherworldly, but they're also grounded because they look like they're actually made with. You know, like, like real life things that exist, like mm-hmm. techniques and you know, like paints and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess it comes uh, from uh, being inspired by the ancient stuff, like yes. you know, the old sculptures. They're generally made out of uh, either like bronze or uh, wood with a paint on top, and that that old look of the sculptures I try to emulate in there. So it's sort of like a mummified. <laughs> look mummified artifact yes. look so i used like a, a metal pre some sort of a metal preset mm-hmm. and then just like with a paint on top of it it's also like fairly easy and then uh at the at the top uh i added that dust layer something like that yeah and that's yeah. super like again um back to the course itself i mean like you could let's say you were to do get like you know you got your scope and just want to take a clay render and then start adding textures to it you could easily potentially achieve this similar look, um, but there's just something in the, simpli- in the simplicity of how you achieve your look. Mm-hmm. Um, because, I, like again, more so because of how well the sculpts in the final image does come out. Like you anticipate, and maybe that's just how artists tend to see art and like the, the, the preset. Like I guess uh, misconceptions we have that like epic stuff requires um epic amounts of energy and input not saying that doesn't in that sense but like you Mm -hmm. know like with the um especially like with the painting side of things um although it's quite logical and it makes complete sense why substance painter would be the perfect um like solution to this especially with how your forms are and how substance painter can exploit those um the fact that it's done so like i guess effortlessly um is quite powerful because i don't i don't know if you'd agree but i guess it gives you more time to just focus on the creation of the sculpt itself and bringing it to life as opposed to worrying about like the technical side of things right yeah 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 absolutely like subspater was a a blessing it's it's such wonderful software it's uh it's very similar to Photoshop, so it, mm. uh, 
I spent like couple, like half an hour learning that software. <laughs> so it's super easy. Like uh, when I was starting out, the the only problem was kind of like bringing the sculpt into into yeah. Substance. But once it's there, it's 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 kind of a playtime. It's it's incredible, incredibly fun software. Like, I, I believe you can't even really you can auto UV directly by importing right now. Oh, right now, yeah, yeah. If uh, I don't know if it works with complex meshes, I haven't tried, but yeah, yeah it, it does auto UV right now, so it's yeah, even. I, th- yeah. I think the more like I think with your sculpts, it would work well because you like the different pieces that you have, like are well made. Like I've I've thrown some abominations at it and it's broken it. Um, oh. So I think, but they, they were like ridiculously complex and they weren't healthy in terms of like how those meshes were um mm-hmm. they were definitely were not sculpts they were just like different crazy kit bash things and yeah mm-hmm. it wasn't cool but nevertheless i've still managed to get some success out of just like doing the auto uv stuff um oh. but nevertheless the way you uv it like that was pretty cool to see that i didn't expect that either um mm-hmm. and then onto the final lesson where you bring it all together um and again with the rendering side of things again once uh, another surprise where i initially thought that it's going to be like you know one of the one of the big boys in the sense of like v-ray or arnold or maybe even octane um but it's the amazing blender the free oh. software um yeah. so actually two quick questions substance painter when did you pick that up is that always since you started going into 3d sculpting or is that something you picked up later uh i can i uh, actually have a date uh there was a. Um, uh my first work it's in my portfolio so uh one moment so it's uh it's three years ago okay yeah three years ago with the substance painter so before that uh all of my sculpts were um key shot Mm. so like i would do one render and then I would put gold on the whole sculpt, and then I would put like uh, one color, and then like like for example like plastic, and yeah. then the whole model is going to be plastic, and then I would bring everything in Photoshop, and then erase. Yes. Yeah, with a mask. But once I discovered substance, then I stopped doing that. And um, Blender, when did you? Is that something that obviously because just the amount of traction it's had over the last few years? Was it more like uh, something that got your attention because of the fact that it's very powerful and also the fact that it's free, would you say? Uh, yeah, it's super powerful and free. I started using it uh, during 2.779, I right. think, uh, back when it was ugly. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, And uh, I don't actually remember why I, I chose Blender, to be honest. Oh, I actually remember. Um, I tried because uh, my sculpts were con- uh, containing a lot of uh, uh, subtools. Mm. So it was kind of painful exporting it one by one into like using OBJs. Yeah. For some reason in Cinema 4D, uh, when I was exporting FBX, it gave me errors or yeah. like it's like 20 minutes exporting one sculpt. It wow. was weird. Yeah, I-, I don't know why, honestly. And then, uh, but Blender kind of like, imported fbx very very fast and so okay like i thought okay i'm gonna stick with blender plus the the cycles is there and uh at the time they had uh some presets in there um like i I would do post-processing in the render viewport Mm -hmm. so i would just like put curves in there or like uh yeah, there was a color profile. It was called, um, I think it was called RRT or something like that. It right. makes your shadows uh, super saturated and black. So I thought like cool. the cycles gave immediately gave me this uh, uh, interesting result. Mm-hmm. So uh, I chose Blender. Plus uh, the Blender, like they have this shader. Uh, in the tutorial, I called it BDSF. It's BSDF. Okay. BSDF. And uh, there's an add on. It's called Note Wrangler. And uh, I would just like, you, you just press Control Shift T and then import all the textures from 
like substance like from the folder with the with yes. the text and then it sets up your shaders and i still don't know how to share, set up shaders it's <laughs> like it's like automatic well i can like connect image texture with base color but it has like you also need to do some like mapping yeah. that stuff but Dude, since it's when you uh, when you showed that it changed my life because yeah. i mainly use like maya and when I go from Substance, it's a case of like plugging all those textures in one by one. And in things like normal maps, you got to change like the profile of something. And it can get quite tedious if you've got like loads of different objects. And then when you simply just show Control Shift T and just select it and that's it. Done. Yeah. I was like, wow. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, was, that was so effortless. I thought like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use it no matter what results it's going to give me. And mm -hmm. turns out, kind of great yeah it's very so, robust as well so it's pretty cool it's it's very cool um also uh, there is an add-on that might be um maybe you can might use it for maya it's called uh uh hedgehog connect or something like okay, that okay let me that down uh um yeah it's called the uh, solo so it's basically like a it's a plugin oh okay i found it i'm gonna link it in your chat oh awesome oh yeah it's a cinema 4d maya it's a live link so you can like import. oh sick it's a solo tool studio sweet solo tool yeah and and you mentioned the word effortless like i think that's what best describes your workflow at least in terms of like as someone who doesn't work in this particular like element trying to maybe adapt into it it mm -hmm. the, the effortlessness does like show and that's quite awesome to see because obviously that's something that i, I hear i can jump onto this and i can extract the things that i want and etc cetera, etc cetera. and even like with your like you know the, the lighting setups that you have and all that kind of stuff it's just like oh of course this is the best way to do it um it's not complex but it makes sense and it mm -hmm. gets to the point, um, it's like it's super efficient. And onto the final lesson, because after you got your render, obviously you got like, and the, and the cool thing is about a sculpt, as you've clearly shown with a lot of your work and even with the course, is that you can kick out like so many renders from different angles. Um, yeah. And a cool thing about like sculpts itself and 3D in general, I guess. Um, and especially with like some like substance, because rather than just like say apply detail to where the camera is facing it obviously you know like applies the material everywhere um and when done correctly you, it just looks amazing at all angles and if you like say you want to tell like a bit of a narrative or you just want to get like say a particular thing that that someone sculpted you just want to get like to the heart of what that is then different angles and different lighting setups which you obviously mentioned in the course as well is quite advantageous to that um but like where's your theory come from when it comes to lighting is that something that you've studied or is that something that, again that's just been more like as long as it showcases how you want to showcase your sculpt that's what sticks yeah uh, i tried to learn that like uh, like some tricks from cinematography but they're mm. so they're like very um narrative driven and uh like the way the sculptures lit like for example in the galleries are usually kind of like top to bottom mm. and uh try to combine two of these approaches ah. uh and m like sometimes gallery lighting shows too much and yes. sometimes like cinematographic like the the light from cinematography hides a little too much yeah. which uh which I like actually, like in the movies, I like when they don't show much. Mm. Like I tried to combine both of them and like, uh, like my sculpts have a lot of like dark in there. Uh, darks, it's mm. kind of like, lets the eye relax uh, for a bit. Yes, for sure. That's, that's why it's, it's generally from, from painting, honestly, like, right. like looking at old masters, uh, the lighting comes from there. The, the setup sometimes very, it's not very, uh realistic mm -hmm. sometimes i even like paint in the light if i need it oh like yeah make the fake light <laughs> if, if it needs and, like, yeah. and, and then the final step is um 
I guess like post processing is it, more, it looks to me like or the way I like to describe it is more like more color grading than it is um you know like they're like typically at least with my workflow it's always been for quite a while I just you know like paint over and getting rid of all the imperfections this mm-hmm. is almost like less to do with the I guess like the forms of the sculpt and trying to like fix anything that may not be like you know like I guess maybe the materials aren't working correct like it's not about that it's more so about how do I showcase this the best way yeah, yeah. the the post processing is it's very minimal mm-hmm. uh, as you saw there it's just like color correction maybe like highlighting some like hiding some stuff that I don't need mm-hmm. for example the, the the part in the back kind of uh it's like too light it, it kind of distracts me so I just kind of uh, paint it in mm-hmm. uh, like give it uh just to make it like a little darker and that's it but uh in my earlier work um i was using like i was doing complex stuff but my gpu did not allow me to render ah. that so i would in blender i would make like a decimation modifier on top of the sculpt and but it becomes mushy yeah i would render that bring it into photoshop open the same angle in zbrush where i had all my detail and then just paint in the detail back. <laughs> Into the skull. I mean, th- those little workarounds and little quirks always add that extra bit of magic. Yeah, and and that's I guess like with the course that that is pretty much it in terms of like the workflow itself, right? I mean, it is the heaviest bit is obviously the the sculpting phase, and maybe you could say even that the the ideation phase is like to make sure you get like a great idea to build off of. Um, but one thing I can attest to. And you've definitely worked hard on it and bringing it into the course is that it's super approachable. Like, like I know if when I was starting out looking at this work, I would have been on one hand in awe by it, amazed by it. And on the other hand, I would have been scared into even like wanting to approach it because my first impression would have been, okay, that's way too complex for me. That's like elite level. I have to wait until I get to a level where I can even think about approaching that. Yeah with the way you've done the workflow and the way you've showcased your own workflow and even taught it, it just shows that it's way more approachable than you'd expect. Um, so in, from, from my take, like you've definitely achieved that in the sense of, you know, it's going to be cool to see how other students and artists take this and create their own things. Um, I'm very happy that you noticed it because uh, my goal was sort of create a beginner tutorial but with a complex sculpt and uh that's why i kind of spent hours in zbrush manual like uh trying to to describe every tool in the correct way and uh, i hope like people would find it useful maybe like they could actually like start 3d feel less intimidated like my my goal was uh, with the sculpt uh was to um like if some people like my work and sort of inspire them because uh like at the end of the tutorial there's like a a finished sculpt that's fairly complex and then they might like it uh and if they follow along they might find that they made something interesting as well something complex too or maybe simpler but, but cool in 3D. Uh, one of my questions was actually going to be, what do you want to have students take away from the course? And obviously you just answered that. Like, and what, like, no, I'm, I'm I'm super excited to see like what people are going to create out of this. Um, <laughs> because I just know it's going to be, it's like, it's going to be some cool, cool, insane things and surprising things as well. Um, yeah. One more for the students. Um, mm-hmm. It's like, what would you recommend and I guess this could be like a blanket thing for anybody of all levels or maybe for beginners, it could be a bit different, but like what thing should people perhaps prep for or have in mind that would help them um, take the course? Or can they just go in both feet first? Mm, let's see. I think they should... Uh... Because for me, the 
thing that sometimes uh stops me is that uh i i don't like i i take i would take a course but then i would not enjoy the the process itself of making it mm. so even a person if if a person doesn't even know zbrush i would just uh advise people just to like or even like digital sculpting just try to uh play around just mush that standard sphere uh, make some a couple of strokes on, on it uh i don't know bring it into photoshop paint over it um i don't know like doodle in your sketchbook and your like symmetry app um or like play around with symmetry there's a unrelated <laughs> topic there's a or actually related there's a scott robertson channel on youtube and there's a video where he plays with photo booth uh so he he takes this uh app on uh, ipad where it makes everything symmetrical in your camera and he brings like different objects in there and uh he renders it in photoshop like uh for someone who has a phone, everybody has a phone, just download a symmetry app, uh, take a napkin, dip it, some ink into it, make some folds in there, and just like play w around with it. See what kind of abstractions would you like, and then see what, if you want, if you would want to bring that into 3D. And if you would uh, want to make some intricate, um, intricate sculpts, not necessarily characters like weapons and props and uh like i don't know like religious altar or something like that if you mm -hmm. want to do that uh then yeah i think you you would enjoy the course hopefully that's awesome um one last question um before we wrap up is from yourself now oh, you mentioned a little bit earlier that you like looking at the next thing now um you've emptied the glass and now you're trying to fill it again um mm -hmm. Do you have any plans for, I guess, like these sculpts that you've really made, this body of work that you've amassed so far and created? Um, like, is there anything that audience, students, appreciators of your work can look forward to you, um, coming from yourself soon? Um, well, I try to kind of approach it slowly. And uh, like with the recent sculpt, I had like these things sound kind of like big that i'm doing like something new but it's just like my approach to art and sculpture and like falling in love with drawing again mm. like uh working on the surface forms that it's a f fascination with that with the um with the volumes like I don't know if you look at, if you would look at the car, you would see like how highlight flows across its surface. If you would look like any objects, you would like look at its form, and that's what I'm fascinated now. Weirdly enough, that I'm only fascinated now by it, and maybe with this new appreciation of form, something new would come along, but. I don't know. There might, there it might be just like a a continuation of the work that I'm doing now. Maybe just a little bit different. Maybe it's going to be completely different. I still don't know. Awesome. Uh, yeah, well, Arsen, thanks so much for your time. Um, your course by the time this podcast is out is also out. Mm -hmm. Organic sculpting oh. is out right now. If you are catching this in the first couple of weeks, you should be able to grab it. 40% off go for an early bird discount um, and remember the first lesson is free as well so you can get some juicy knowledge um, initially um, before you jump straight into the course and any final words from you Austin to your new students and potentially new fans of your work that's that's difficult uh, final words um... Um, well, uh, there, w uh, there was one word that kind of, uh, 
that I like spoke a lot about. It's like emotional side of the art and uh, maybe if people would connect with that side of the art that maybe not what brings um not what brings a uh, monetary uh value to their work or uh like lend their job lend them more jobs but like generally makes them more interested in art makes them happier uh that that would be cool so i guess that that's my final words yeah. awesome thanks larson uh thanks so much massive thanks to arson for joining us his learn squared course organic sculpting is out now hit the link below and sculpt your imagination let us know in the comments below if you're taking the course and which of arson's sculpts are your favorite till next time Thank <music> you.